<laughs> okay, like I said, we're located in beautiful Pike County, New Mexico. We're at 7,550 feet. We're just west of the Continental Divide. We have four dynamic seasons, um, and it's just a wonderful place to live. It's a very small, tight-knit community. Uh, we're to the west of us. There's a very large plain, uh, and it, the wind generally creates very good seeing for us, one to two arc seconds. Sometimes we get lucky with sub arc second seeing. Why is this not? It seems like you're. Re Let me see here. Okay, here we go. Uh, here's a map of our area. Top of the world land sales is right in the middle. And the little town of Pie Town is just about two miles away from us. Albuquerque is going to be off to the upper right. And we all, all other little towns around here, not very big population centers, all maybe five, 600 folks at most. Our neighbors is the VLA, very large array, and it's located in the San Agustin Valley or Plain, and it's surrounded by a mountain range that suppresses and, and uh, uh, keeps a lot of the radio noise and racket out so they can do very sensitive radio work. Also further to the east is the Magdalena Ridge Observatory. We see the optical interferometer here, and then on the top of the hill here is the 3.8 meter telescope. Now, my little telescope, I bought this from a guy in Astromart in Ellensburg, Washington. Uh, it was a mess. It had set open. His the, This guy's father had passed on a few years earlier, and he was just looking to get this thing out of his yard. Uh, I bought it for about $1,200 off Astromart. And it, it's been a work in progress. The, the shutters were missing um, and taken off. It was a mess inside. Here the door, the door needed a lot of work, but you know, we did a lot of fiberglass work. We did a lot of cleaning and getting the, the flex seal off of it and repainting it and all that. And this is what it looks like in Mesa. I, Put it together in Mesa. I used to live in Mesa, Arizona. I was a product support engineer for Boeing on the Apache helicopters for 33 years. Um, and I put this observatory up and together here just to see how it would work and all of that. And it, But in the meantime, we bought property in Pie Town. And this was before I retired in 2012. We bought 17 acres here in Pie Town at the present location. And so when I retired from Boeing, we decided we were going to move up here and put this observatory together and put down new roots and call it home. So we got us a manufactured home, delivered and set up, put together, and that was quite a bit of work. Uh, we drilled a water well. We're off-grid solar. I put a complete solar uh, installation in. And that included the panels, the generator. Uh, here's the deck we're going in on, on the house. Here's the battery house. This is where the inverter and all the electronics is located for the house power, as well as my telemetry tower for the astronomy part of it, which has a Davis II weather system, a dark sky meter, cloud sensor, a SBIG, um uh polar uh camera polar camera and an all sky camera okay or a seeing monitor i guess that's what the sbig seeing monitor all right and we wire all that up it's all it's all the telemetry is we get i can get it on my computer when, whenever i need it all right this is the this is a plot for the first observatory and when I put all the electronic the electricity in and built the solar, I wired the entire place for electricity at that time. So what you see sticking up is the wire and the conduit for the first observatory. And it's uh, where it's located is just north of the house on a slight plateau. And it's it was a relatively easy dig to get the foundation in. And... Here's the next picture. Here's my little tractor. I love my little tractor. It saves me so much work and so much back pain. But that little green square is the foundation base for the observatory. 
It was during the dig. I was digging down about four feet into a, close to a bedrock. And then when we got there, we formed it. And I, it didn't show the steel, but there was a lot of steel, that con, uh, rebar and web steel that went into the, to the mesh steel that went into the base. Uh, the center box is obviously for the central pier. And then we laid block after the concrete was poured and rebar was in, we, I laid block, a uh, 16 inch block up out of the ground and backfilled it. So you see the central pier, you see the concrete block, which is filled with concrete and the rebar. It's very stable. All of that's just one big concrete slab in the bottom, and I don't think it'll ever move. And there's no vibration either. So at the top of all the block work, here's the floor. And these plans came from uh, Explorescope uh, for an eight-foot building, and it worked perfect for a 2.3-meter dome. It just It's just perfect size. So I swiped their plans and, and used those to build this. And it'll, those are, are two by eights, vertic uh, the, the vertical pieces are two by eights, and everything's screwed together, okay? And then everything got painted, nice color, nice white. Then we put down the floor, and this is uh, three quarter inch uh, exterior grade plywood. And it's screwed down like, like every eight inches. It's not gonna go anywhere, it's an integral part of the floor. And then over on the right, you can see the where the pier is. All right, my helper showed up and we got the walls up. Uh, these are kits, so they screw right back together. And they, the way Sirius did it was they matched the uh, ends. So A to A, B to B, C to C, and et cetera. So they're pre-fit, pre-drilled. You can't screw them up when you put them together. Um, they're really a really a nice dome once you get them working and that was kind of a challenge so and, and here you'll see the two of them one on the right is the one i used with my personal observatory the one here on the left is not yet finished and it's basically ready for an occupant to to come in and and uh put a scope in this is from the platform looking toward the south, toward my scope. You see the dome on the ground. And I was really flustered and worried about how I was going to get these domes on top of these buildings. And it's because you can't pick them up. You can't, you know, there's no way you can lift them because they're pretty heavy. But in our development, we had come acquired a, a really nice lift. And I'll show you that here in a minute. Uh, here's my really good friend, Kevin, working on the landing and the handrail, putting them in. Um, you've noticed these steps are kind of short and close together. It's because I have a disabled leg and it's hard for me to climb the steps. So I had to make them where I could get up and down pretty easy. Here's another picture of the landing after all the wood is in, before it was painted. And here's our lift. And I don't I'm the guy here with the funny hat. This is my son, Brian, and my good friend, Kevin. And my other friend, uh, Glenn, Glenn Campbell, is over here in the tie wraps. So basically, we had a chain, and, and really on the top of the Sirius domes, there's two lifting lugs that you can use, like we did here, to lift this thing up with chains and guide ropes and set it in place. And it was very, it, it took less than a half an hour and we had both domes up and in. And it was like, wow, because I, I really didn't know how I was going to get them up there. I was thinking, well, can we get them up the landings? Can we take them upstairs? And there's just no way we could do it. So Glenn brought the Tyrex the Terex over and boom, boom, boom. We were up and in in no time, which was kind of nice. It's, you know because I didn't want anybody to get hurt because we're a long way from any medical care or anything like that. There's a second dome going on and it's just a matter of just putting the caps on. Very easy. They all pretty fit and everything was already together. Both of these domes I bought secondhand, so I know they worked. 
The second dome I got from a, a guy by the name of Bob Buckheim. He's he's one of the head guys for the uh, small telescope uh, survey work, ASA. I don't know if you ever heard of them. They're in California. And um, his wife lovingly called this observatory I bought for him R2-D2 from Star Wars. So anyway, so the domes went up pretty easy. They went on, putting the tops on. No pinch fingers. Nobody got hurt. And there they are. They rotated easy. Sirius has a really nice way of uh, the domes. They rotate no problem. Nice, nice large wheels. And then after that, got inside and started putting the top in. Here's the upper shutter motor. And this is the latest version from Sirius. They used to have a different design where they'd have a long pull push rod coming up from the opposite side that would open and close the dome. And this is a little easier to work. It ta takes a little, it doesn't get caught. It won't hang up um, like the other one did, but the, this one really works well. And the, the thing on the left over here is a ventilation fan, solar ventilation fan. And here's the two lifting lugs. So this is where it was lifted from. Very, very convenient. They really had their head together when they thought this dome out. They're a very nice dome. I can't, I can't commend them enough for how well it works, even here. And then the interior work come. And uh, there's my digital logger switching module here. It lets me get on the internet, turn everything on or off as I need. Um, you see some of the internal wiring and stuff like that. Um, the peer is a SBI or a software disk mirror, uh, software disk peer, excuse me. And I have on top of that, my trusty Paramount MX. And I absolutely love this mount. It's accurate. It's, I mean, I have it down, the T point pointing is down to about 20 arc seconds or less. It's it's just phenomenal and how well it does. We did the initial pointing or polar alignment with my four inch, my trusty four inch uh, Williams refractor. And on the left over here, the white box is the azimuth drive box, it contains the motors and all the circuit cards for to make that work. And it's all automatically, uh, um, slave to the, the mount, so when it, whenever the mount moves, the, the dome follows along with, which is very nice. Basically, at night, I go out and open the dome, and then I come in the house, I turn everything on, I do an entire imaging evening, and I'm never outside. And then at night, when I, or in the morning when I'm done, I just go out, make sure everything's okay, put the cap on, close the dome, and I'm good. I have my data, and then I go to bed. After we got done with that, we put the main scope on. This is my uh, 12 and a half inch RCOS astrograph. Uh, I bought this new from RC Optical in, in uh, 2007. Um, it is an astrograph. It's an F6.3, not an F9 like what they were used to making. And we were able to put it in, a, in an actual tube. In an actual carbon fiber tube. There was some question about the length of the focal length where it would fit or if anything could be sticking out the back end. And I, no, it didn't. It all fit inside, which was really great. I love this scope. It, I had the uh, mirrors recoded recently, um, and it's it's just it's just been a wonderful telescope. And it's got a nice rotator on the back. Everything works on it. Never had a real problem with it. Uh, a couple little electrical problems, but they were just wires I needed to fix, which wasn't a problem at all, because that's what I did. And then after it's all put together, here's the camera. I have an SBIG SDL 11000 with a KIA chip, 11000 chip, the uh, um, filter wheel. And then here on the other side of the telescope is the TIM unit. I upgraded from the TCC2, which was a problem, error problem. It had a lot of failures and stuff in it. Uh, but I got the TEM, and it's given me no trouble at all. It controls the temperature, uh, controls the fans, it controls heating of the secondary if we need it, uh, just everything. And uh, it controls the focuser, the whole nine yards. And it all runs through there, and it, it, it works seamlessly and without, without a problem. And with that, 
it lets me take pictures like this. Um, I'm sure you all know what this is, NGC 891. And this is a reprocess. I just got done with this sometime back and I'll explain when I get to the PixInsight part. Um, but I was able to go in and do some additional sharpening and deconvolution and noise reduction on this image. And I think it made it stand out even better. The dust lane is really prominent and the star sizes have shrunk considerably. That's my beautiful cluster, 15. Um, this was one of the better ones I think I've done for a lobular cluster. There's new processing tools that have come out that have made the chore of these a little easier. This is a object, what I would like to call an object oriented uh, processing the things that I'm going to do to a galaxy are not the same that I'm going to do to a globular cluster or a nebula or things like that. Here's the monkey head nebula. This is a, just a recent release, and this has got all the little tools, the new tools that I've that I like uh, in it, and. It's, uh, I can forget how many hours, it's like 20 hours, 20 hours of data. So, yep. I see 342. Uh, this again is a reprocess with all the new, new, uh, tools and features and picks inside. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Russ Perlman or heard of Russ Perlman, but he's got some new AI tools out that are just phenomenal. Uh, for noise reduction and for deconvolution, just just spectacular. And then M51. This is the one that Dennis wanted me to comment on. And says, "Yeah, I want you to come and talk to our group." <laughs> M36, uh, open cluster. M106. And 3486, NGC 3486. And that's what I have in pictures. So what I'd like to do is hop out of that and hop to, to uh, PixInsight. And I need to move this down here out of the way. And, uh, Okay, so I can open this discussion up for any questions, uh, comments, or would you want uh, me to proceed uh, right into fix and say? Well, well, I have a question. Sure. Um, what, so why did you elevate your observatory so high? Was it to do with flooding or oh, to get no. out of the trees? Well, in 2004, Ron Wadowski, he's the author of from uh, New Astronomy Press, presented an article about ele uh, elevating an observatory to increase the seeing, to make the seeing better. And that was, a, to elevate these was an experiment to see if that was true. And it is. I was in I got a little different in seeing. I'm a little bit out of ground effect, a little bit out of the... The, the heat off the ground. And it makes a slight difference in the stellar profiles. So yeah, that's, that's kind of why I raised them up off the ground. There's a, uh, in New Mexico skies down southeast of us, down around Proud Puff, there's a, these guys put their observatories on like 20 foot towers, steel towers to see what they're in seeing would be like. And they get down oh, pretty close to arc second, sub arc second seeing. It's all pretty comparable, but there is a slight improvement. So that's why we, that's why I did that. And so is that, is that to do with the uh, air currents on the ground, ground, is it, or heat coming? Yes, it, it's to get away from the, the air effects in the ground and to little, a little ventilation under the telescope, under the observatory helps push all that air out of the way. And, we're I'm really lucky because there's no concrete. There's no nothing that's going to create and hold heat and radiate it at night. It's all bare 
forest. It's all bare dirt. And there's nothing that's going to be that can do that. But I thought, you know, if there's a chance, if I can improve my seeing capability at all, I will. And, you know, that, that to me is the ultimate is, is, is trying to get to as close to one arc second as I can. The telescope, the, the plate scale on the telescope is 0.86 arc seconds per pixel. So I have a very, very fine discriminatory range of, of how small I can make, how, how small I can make stellar profiles. And the some of the stars, it's, it's, they're very tiny. It's, it's, this is comparable to New Mexico skies. It's comparable to Sierra remote out in California and a few of the other ones in here in the state as well as in Arizona and California. So, you know. Right, thanks. Uh, Bob, what, 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 what is the focal length of your uh, main telescope? It's 2,155 millimeters. So uh, have you done planetary solar system objects for that? Uh, I have done some planetary, but I'm a deep sky guy. I like galaxies. Um, yeah. I worked with uh, Dr. Dieter Hunter from Lowell Observatory on a project uh, called Little Things, and she was looking for uh, her her whole course of study was star formation in irregular dwarf or dwarf irregular galaxies, and so she wanted us to take very long pictures of these little dwarf galaxies. Well, I just got hooked on imaging galaxies, and so I kind of tuned away from planetary work, and and work went off into deep sky. Thank you. Just to bring this back. Okay. A any other? Uh, how are we doing on time? Are we okay on time? Yeah, fine. No problem. Okay. I, I would really like to uh, talk about my eight essential steps in Pix Insight. And I don't know who among you guys use Pix Insight. I find, okay, great. I see one hand up. Uh, I find it a very complete and um, Easy. Very complete program that's very adaptable to uh, astro imaging, astrophotography. I agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing, my own little thing, uh, now I'm a student of Adam Block. I don't know how many of you guys know Adam Block. Um, he's a world renowned imager. He works at the Stewart Observatory, Mount Lemon. Uh, he's a researcher. He was into public outreach, still is, but he has this uh, business, he calls it Adam Block Studios. And he puts and produces a wide variety of functional, very helpful tutorials on processing. And I highly recommend anybody that's a serious student of PixInsight to at least go and, and check out his work, check out what he does. He's got some free, he's got some things on YouTube, on a YouTube channel. Um, yeah, he's, he's world class. He's, he's second to none. He's, he's an absolute genius, in my opinion. He's taught me about everything I know. But there's eight essential steps, I feel, to fix insight for processing. And the first one is blink. Okay, this is the blink tool. And what I do when I get a data set, and especially if I've shot new biases, and new darks, is I will open up all of that and go through the blink tool and oh, look at it. Sorry, sorry, Sandra. we're looking at your previous uh, slides. slides. We're not looking at... Uh... Oh, you're not. Okay, you're not looking at the blink. Okay, um, how do I get back to... Uh, well, well, well. Let's go back to here. Ah. Okay. Now you see. I see you guys. Let's see if we can get to. Okay, you see that? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so 
link tool. I go through, like I said, when I do a new set of biases and darks, I will go through and inspect every frame. And it's not that I'm going to find, it's that I can find. And I will find sometimes zones of bright, zones of dark. Um, sometimes my flats don't really look that good. Sometimes the data will be out of focus. Sometimes there's a tracking error, et cetera, et cetera. So let's show in here. Okay, this, this is a representation of a bad bias. Okay, this is obviously a mess up. Okay, because of it's there's a tracking error and it's out of focus. All right. It's these kind of things that I look for to, to weed out of the data set before I get too far along. I don't like to perpetuate errors. Here's a globular cluster that's way out of focus. So it's these things that I'd like to take out and take care of before I, I progress. Okay. I don't go, I don't take blind steps forward, not knowing where I'm at. I always like to know where my data is at, what condition it's in and what the next logical step's gonna be, all right? So after we get through inspecting everything and we go through and if we find one, um, we can move it out of here. There's a little button down here we push and I will usually take and put it in like a folder to be deleted or something like that, bad frames or whatever, then I can get rid of those, okay? So, the next thing after we get done doing that is cosmetic correction. Now, my older chip, I've noticed is beginning to develop lots of columns, okay, bad columns. So you get this long black line going from the top to the bottom of the frame. Well, that gets to be a bit disgusting because after a bit, you see the images are aligned and I do dither my data so every every image is going to be a slightly a few pixels in a different place and I do that for noise um, but these doggone columns still exist so what I have to do is I go I use auto detect with a hot sigma of three which eliminates most all of the hot pixels but for the columns themselves, I have to go through and I build this defect list. And this is every column that's defective on my chip, on that KIA chip. And when I use this, it absolutely helps in getting rid of that, that bad stuff. Because I hate being able to have a beautiful picture run by a mess of columns that you can't do anything with. I mean, you can you can take the the clone tool and, and carefully go over the top, but that is tedious. And I like it. I'm a global kind of person, I like doing things globally. So when it's in that format, it's all done at once. It's over with. There's no missing. Every frame is done. So that cosmetic correction is definitely part of the setup for WBPP. And that is my third of the eight essential steps and it's in scripts and batch processing and this tool i love this tool this tool will let me do a lot of things and it will do it in such a way that there's a complete record and i can go back and if there's a mistake made i can go back and redo it change what i need to and go back and redo it and because it has this most of the steps it's done in cache, it just goes right back, does them over, okay? And then it proceeds with what you've changed. This is the palette you see here. Um, so I have it set up for, what was this? This was for NGC 3486. I haven't cleared it out yet. But anyway, this gives you a complete breakdown. Okay, here's the bias frames. I use 50. I use 50 as a minimum for bias frames. Uh, I, I do everything bend one by one, by the way, okay? And darks, I use 15. These are like 900 seconds. And my naming convention for this is DH900 under bar 25. D is dark. H is highest resolution, which is one by one. 900 is the seconds, okay, or in time of the dark exposure. And then 
25 is the minus Celsius 25 degrees for the camera temperature. So this is the darks. And then here's my flats. I use a uh, all attack flat box mounted on the roof or on the wall of the uh, inside wall or inside roof or ceiling of the observatory. And when I home the mount and home the, or not home it, but when I park them, they line up and then I can plug it in and do my, my flats and I'm very good to go. So it's, that, that's kind of the easy bit there. So there's the, the lights. Okay. And there again, it has the, the filter, the time, the image, and then the calibration thing. Oh, and here, this is, this is where you're going to set up a lot of your actual calibration stuff um you set up like in the linear defects use this as an addition to the cosmetic correction with the thing with all of the columns this helps alleviate what's left over okay and i just set it up to defaults and let it go uh, the sub subframe weighting there's different schemes for this if it's a globular cluster where it's just stars versus a nebula or galaxy where it's other stuff okay so there's a, a selection to be made here and the nice thing is when i pop this out there's user notes and it tells you along the side here exactly what each of one of these functions does and how it interacts with the data image registration astrometric uh, solution uh, this is very nice to use when we get further on and we're doing photometric color calibration we know exactly what object we're looking at, okay? Right, right ascension declination. All right, and then local normalization. I do this in a manual way so I can control um, how that normalization is going to affect the image. And then image integration. Yeah, it takes everything and puts it together. So I get the masters of the luminous, the red, the green, the blue, the HA, the O3, the S2, whatever it is I'm imaging. It comes out to me as a master. And so it's a so it's an all-inclusive program that gets me over the biggest hump of image processing, and that's getting it calibrated and getting it put together. Okay. Saves a lot of lot of headache there. All right. Uh calibration, this this is kind of cool, I feel. Uh this puts it all out in one sheet for you to see exactly what you've got and how it's going to interact with other functions. Here's the blue uh, data, and we see it's going to be calibrated with a blue flat and a blue, or a 900 second dark, excuse me. And then also over here, when I select on this, we see that CC has been uh, turned on, and you can check that by looking here, cosmetic correction, and we see they're all checked. So we know that this is going to be applied to all of the frames. So there's not going to be any outliers. And uh, there's for if you're doing HA type data or narrow band data, uh, you can change the pedestal base. Okay. You can add the pedestal base to make sure you have no negative or zero numbers in the data. So you don't have a bunch of black dots in your picture in your HA or your S2 or O3 data. Okay. And this nice thing about this post calibration, it tells you exactly what you're going to end up with. Okay. Hours of data or how long it's going to be integration time. You can put together an image, an RGB image here if you wish. All right. And the pipeline I find really helpful because it's kind of a checklist of calibration process, how it's going to go through the process of making your pictures. So when you say select go, it puts this up with a little line beside it and then just checks them off as it goes. And then when it's interactive, it will stop like here at local or uh, right here at LN reference and you do, you have to manually select it. You have to interface with it manually at that point for these four say, and then the rest is all automatic to the integration of the image, and then you're complete. So that is the third 
part of my eight essential steps is using this tool to give me clean data that is ready to put together to make an image. I'm gonna hop out of that. The next thing I find for, especially for RGB imaging is mirrored noise. Um, here I have just an image and I just copied it off of okay, this guy. So this is what we call a preview. It's a small part segment of this main image. And what I'd like to do is I'm gonna bring it up here. Yep, wrong spot, that's right. It's under noise, reduction, mirror, denoise. And this is kind of a preset kind of thing. Once you know about the detector, you know the gain, you know the read noise, then you're able to, this variance scale, play around with this variance scale and get a really nice um, noise reduction. And this is helpful going into, especially before you do anything else, um, like put it together in an RGB image. Okay, so there I have to get rid of this. There's the after. Here's a before. Let me zoom in a little more. Can you guys see this? Yeah. 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 Okay. You see the difference? Yeah. Okay. It just mutes this noise down a little bit. Okay. And I don't really like the plasticky, fake backgrounds. I like a little rough to them to make it give it a little realism, but I don't like it too noisy that it's going to interfere with the image and so that's 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 one of the things and then um after i get done with mirrored noise that's number what is that that's number four i go in and, and i will work on dbe dynamic background extraction so i'm going to close that i have an art a where is it at Here we go. So the first one here is going to be for our TBE. No, wait a minute. I had this set differently. Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. <laughs> the next thing I would like to do after after that, I got ahead of myself, is dynamic background extraction. Okay, so I'm gonna just do this on this image real quick, and give you a quick demo on it. So I'm gonna bring up the actual process, dynamic background extraction. Okay, I'm going to click on the image, all right? And I like to set my tolerance kinda high. I'll go as high as 10 on some of these, depending on light pollution or not only really light pollution, but just the, the, the color or if there's any gradients in the image. Okay. The smoothness, I usually will set to 6, 0.6. And then this will be fine. Um, just generate these points. And then I go around. I'm going to, I can regenerate these. I'm going to get rid of these real quick. Yes, I'm not. Um, next thing is going to be, let's see where I'm at here. Pardon me, I need my glasses. This tiny print gets me. Um, the next thing we're going to do is going to go around the image and move these things down and get these away from start at these points. Okay. I'm not going to take the time to do that. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I don't know if you've used this or not. Um, Adam has got a really good tutorial on this. I don't want to take a lot of time on doing these demonstrations, um, but maybe I can do just this. Hold on. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
But anyway, this is one of the essential tools that I do use, and it helps flatten the background. So, um, for the image correction, after I get these all moved around and, and put away where they're not going to contact stars, um, I will change the image correction to subtraction, replace the target image, okay, and just go. And I launch it with the green check mark down here. So I'll launch it. I don't know how well it's going to work because I didn't go through it, but it's going to give us a model of the image. And that is the model. Wow. You don't want that. And then we take a look at the actual image itself. Now, because there's other things, these, these little checks were around the stars, uh, I'm going to focus more out here on the corner um, for the flatness of the image and the color correction. And the next thing, after I get done with, with this, with DBE, and it comes out much better than what I'm trying to show you here, is I will use this thing called SCNR. And to get rid of the green, there's all kinds, if you look at this real carefully, there's lots of green in there. So I will use SCNR full strength, average neutral, 100%, and just launch it, boom. And that gets rid of the green, gives me a more, more neutral sky color, okay? So you can kind of get an idea of, you know, that's that's where you want to go. And this is after you're, you do uh, the steps on, on balancing things out just to get rid of the green. And then photometric color calibrations after that. Um, this is where the important part of having your astrometric data uh, come into play, because it's got to know precisely what the object is, because it's going to look at the spectrum of the stars around it, whether they're uh, O's, B's, G's, F's, A, whatever type star they are, whatever spectral color they're going to be, that's what it's going to use. It's from the Gaia 2 or Gaia 3 catalog. And it's going to accurately give you a return of what the color balance should be. So the old days of doing an RGB balance and all that are gone. Uh, this is all automatic. And it's really kind of quick. You just, you just push the button on it. And away it goes. And it generates, it, it takes about a minute or so for it to generate the, the effect or the the result and it give go ahead okay it gives you the white bunk white balance functions of the image okay and it tells me by the line because it's low here and it goes up it tells me it's cor it's a correct balance it, it's and he's the line is following most of where the stars are at so it's it's very accurately determining what this white balance function should be so this this image here would be ready to go to the next step and for that i'm going to shade that i'm going to do rc up or rc astro this is russ croman's new uh tool and i'm absolutely crazy about this tool it allows us to do deconvolution at a very accurate way, without any Gibbs effect, without any ringing, without any distortions. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm going to do it on this small preview. And I'm just going to open, I opened it up a while ago before we started this, and uh, I'm gonna reset it to the defaults. This is how it comes from the defaults. And I'm just going to apply it to the image. And I'm gonna just see what we get. Okay, this is the before, and I'll zoom in and show what it does to the stars, how it does. All right, go away. See how this is going to look. Because, you know, it, a deconvolution, it's, it's a program. It never spot, it's supposed to do a lot. It's never, it wasn't designed to do a lot. And it's not supposed to do a lot. But this particular program here, I can sit back and go, wow, this is an awesome piece of equipment. This is an awesome uh, addition to our arsenal of tools we have for processing. And it takes a little bit, but it's worth the wait.
Come on. My computer's running a little slow. A little background galaxy there. Wow. Uh oh. So, um, is is all of this making sense? Is am I off in the weeds? Or are you guys following this okay? Or is everything all it's right? Base for me, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got one happy fella here. Yeah. I didn't say I have blood stimulator. So. <laughs> Just what let's process it, Paul. Could uh, could just ask you a question on that spare here right. that you have at the moment? Are you hiring that out, or have you got something already to, to go on to it? Um, well, I'm having a real hard time hearing you. Uh, the, the audio is garbled, and I think it's on my end because this processor is working so hard to try to process this this little data. So the, 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 it's coming through garbled. Um, can you guys can you hear me okay on this end though? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, because I sometimes when it comes through, it's, it's garbled on, on on your end, or and I don't know if it's me or what. Yeah, we hear you perfectly. Perhaps you can repeat the question. Yeah, if, if I repeat the question, uh, it was okay. the, you've got a spare peer at the moment. Have you already uh, got someone? to take it, or are you hoping to hire it out to someone? The observatory, it's a second observatory. Oh, no, so. I don't have any, I, I, that is, that's an empty, the second observatory is empty right now. I need to finish the pier in the middle and uh, in the interior. I need to put the carpet and everything down. Uh, everything else is ready to rock and roll with it though. It's, it's all finished. Um, and it's 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 all fully automated. It's got a full set of cards. So even the shutters themselves, you can control over the internet. I use uh, uh, Maxim. Oh, who makes that? Uh, Diffraction Limited. Uh, their program for dome control, and it interfaced perfectly with the uh, with the SkyX that I used to control the telescope. So, so, so the, the other part of the question, Bob, was. Is it for yourself, or are you going to hire it out? Say again? Is, is it for yourself, the use of that observatory? No, it's, uh, I've got three more observatories I'm going to be putting up this summer. Uh, my whole hope and desire is to have a, a small remote hosting facility up here where I can put a few friends as telescopes and, and watch over it while, uh, you know, watched over them while they're living different places. Um, the only long pole in the tent right now for me is internet access. I do, we do not have broadband up here right now. <laughs> it's supposed to be in our future soon. But until then, I'm kind of just biding my time on this thing until we can get everything up and going. But I've got two 10-foot domes, and I've got a 7-foot Astro Haven clamshell dome that are – basically in parts down here in the storage box waiting to be put together. So I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. Is, um, is there any future with Elon Musk's Sky, Skylink satellites or? Well, the hassle I've had with Musk is, um, huh, I we live so close to the, uh, VLA that we're in a restricted zone, believe it or not. Uh, and it's hard with, there's one here at, at uh, the VLA and then there's one in Green Bank back in West Virginia. And there are people here in the area that have Starlink and I'm looking into getting Starlink. Um, but I'm, I was hoping that there would be a T1 or a fiber optic or something that would come in that we could tie on to and you know because in this field this business data handling is the biggest thing yeah. and when you're downloading you know 20 megabit images and you got 300 of them you got quite a bit of data 
And um, so, you know, that that's a long pole. We have a beautiful location and we have everything here, electrical and, you know, we have the people that can put the things together to make everything work. We've done it. It's just the internet. So that's where I'm at. Okay, so it's finally finished uh, with this. This is the <laughs> this is the after. Okay, and I'm back on uh, Blur Exterminator here. This is the after, and I'm going to lower that a bit. That's the after. This oops. This is the before. Oops. No, it's not. What am I doing? Let's get over here and do. Okay. I'm going to just get rid of this. Tell you what, I'm going to get rid of this picture because it's giving me nothing but trouble. And I'm going to get a new one. Open up. Uh, All right, I'm just going to open up the luminance here of the monkey head. See that. I don't need to see that, but I do need to see this. Okay. And for the last part of this, I'm going to do this over just to show you what it can look like and not make any silly mistakes like I did last time. I always make these mistakes. Okay. So I'm going to go right to the preview. All right, I'm going to blow that up, and then I'm going to launch this exterminator again on this, and it shouldn't take but just a second or so to make it work, because I want to show you what this tool can do, and it, it didn't work the last time, but I want to I want to give it the opportunity. Okay, there it is. That's the after. This is the before. Let me blow this up a little more. That's the after that's the before okay you see the difference i mean to me this makes a huge difference in especially things like star clusters globular clusters and stuff like that just unbelievable okay and then the last thing uh, and that was number seven the last thing that i'd like to, to uh, show is the noise exterminator and what it can do. And here again, I'm just gonna run with the defaults. And the nice thing about these, there's not a lot of things to change. There's not, there's no pixel math. There's no masking. There's no, none of that. It just works. I mean, if you do change your parameters here a little bit, you know, it makes an effect, but there, it's not very complicated at all. And you get a report right away. You get to see right away what it's done. So this one's for the noise. And look at that. You see that? See how that noise just went away? That's the after. Here's the before. Let me blow this up a little more. Okay. That's the before. There's the after. So it makes a huge difference. And in fact, you don't even really need to do mirror denoise at this point. Nor do you need to do other computational heavy programs like TVG denoise or other programs like that that are computationally intensive, it's gonna take a long time, have a lot of parameters to figure out. And you can get lost in there and say, ah, I just, okay, I ain't gonna do that, right? But this RC Astro Noise Exterminator, it's just a push and go and you got a good result, okay? So that that's my eight steps to, to uh, uh, picks in sight, vital steps, essential steps that I that I use in almost every image. Now, the thing about image, there's no step A, step B, step C, step D. You're going to do different steps, take different approaches, different avenues and routes to get to the end result in processing different objects. Object-oriented processing, there's different Globular clusters are obviously different than galaxies, different than nebulae, different than planets, lunar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the tools are all there. And I've just scraped the surface of today on what is possible in PixInsight. So uh, Warren Keller, a uh, good friend of mine, 
He's got classes that he works on students with from Fix Insight, Adam Blocks, uh, Adam Block Studios. Highly recommend, highly recommend uh, him for his tutorials and how he explains things. He's he's a very um, animated. He's a very good public speaker. He's been doing this for a year. I've known Adam Block since 1996, and we're good friends as well. So I I push his products and what he does, and because he's he's very smart and he's very intelligent, and he's been taking pictures forever. Um, but that's kind of my 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 uh, my spring, my my little program. Um, so I, I hope it, I hope you guys got something from this. Absolutely, um, it was brilliant. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Um, are you on Astro Bin? Uh, yeah, I have an Astro Bin. I, I, yeah. I have things posted there. I haven't posted there in a while. Um, I've just been basically, well, the last thing I do things I have been doing has been going through and um, working on on the tutorials in PixInsight and developing different routines and different path parameters for processing different type objects. Uh, I haven't posted a whole lot there in a while. Um, I suppose I will later this spring. I'm hoping that to get back into imaging soon here at the observatory. It's been rather snowy. We got eight inches of snow on Monday. It came down in like three hours. Um, and it came down on the top of 10 inches that were already there. So we're kind of buried at the moment. Hopefully this will all melt away and I can get back to imaging here soon. Like a clear night, maybe even tonight. I, don't know. I thought that might be another reason why you uh, moved your um, domes up a little bit higher <laughs> <laughs> because of the snow. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the snow can get to your knees here. It's it's not a problem for that. We're seventy five fifty in feet elevation, so uh, it can get pretty pretty challenging. Driving up here can be a challenge. We you have to have a four wheel drive to get up here to the observatory. And, uh, you know, during the, the bad time of the year, but the, 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 uh, the sky, the sky here outweighs the beauty of the night sky here outweighs any inconvenience you have with a storm or snow on the ground. It's, uh, you know, it's what I wanted. It's what I needed to have to be able to do this kind of work and, and to uh, be alone away from up, away from the big cities up here on the mountain. So. Anyway, um, oh. yes, the other observatories are going to be put together this year. Um, and I'd like to be able to host a few people, a few folks, um, as time goes on. And um, <laughs> they, too, can have some of the wonders of the night sky here at, at, in, uh, in Pi Town. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions from you guys? Well, you're going right to renting your service. <laughs> <laughs> he did, uh, can I just say he actually jumped in just before I could have said the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> so, so what's the going rate for the uh, observatory rental? Um, well, I haven't really set a rate. Uh, I'd like to make it where it's affordable. I couldn't imagine any more than five hundred dollars a month um, for for a site here for a pier. Um, you know, I mean, if I don't know. I, I, it's kind of the number that I was thinking of when, when we came up here. There's places that get a whole lot more. Um, Sierra Remotes, like $1,500 a month for a pier. Uh, I know that um, New Mexico Skies is about that, too. Um, so, I'm, I, I, you know, I went to the Advanced Imaging Conference in California one year, and I walked up to the desk. This guy was talking about SRO, Sierra Remote. And so I just asked him, I said, well, uh, what are you getting for a, for a pier there? And he goes, well, 1500 And I'm like, man, that's a house payment. I can't afford that. My wife would kill me. No. <laughs> so that, that was kind of one of the things that put the, lit the fire in my backside to uh, find a place and, and, and make it reality here. And I thought, you know, since we have this place, why not open it up for others to experience the night sky here? And uh, so that's that's kind of what I'm doing. It's kind of what I'm out to do. Um, you know, I, I, I have an engineering background. 
and I worked, uh, you know, structures. I, I mean, I, I can build things. <laughs> I can really build a lot of things. So mm -hmm. uh, the observatories is, is no big deal. And um, so we, we got plenty of room to expand here. We got 17 acres and, and a lot of places to put observatories. So anyway. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. Would you be interested? Yeah. Would you be okay. Interested? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I have a question. So. Yes. Would you be interested in hosting groups? Publishing what? Uh, the, the question is, would you be interested in hosting groups of people? Uh, there's there's uh, a few of us who travel to the south of Spain uh, where they have a remote hosting facility, but we go down there with our telescopes. Um, yeah, just, just wondering whether you have thought about tourism or, you know, on a small scale, you know, if you've got a group of people. Um, that is a possibility. I do have, now this would be for the summer only. We do have a, um, a camp trailer that'd be available. We have, we would have, you know, uh, a place available for, to set up telescopes on the back deck. I mean, is, um, it, is there a, a sort of local hotel or, or somewhere? You know, with, 20 miles you know? away. Uh, right, yeah. There's, okay. there's about 20 miles away. Um, right, right. A little okay. town called Kamado. There's a motel. Um, and, yeah, that would definitely be a possibility if you all wanted to, you know, cross the pond and come see us. We'd love to see you. And, um, um, the, the other thing, Bob, is obviously, uh, you know, in Europe we can – put all our kit into a van and drive down there, but we wouldn't be able to do that uh, where you are. are. Are there any telescope rental facilities where we can hire, you know, basics of, you know, eight, 10 inch Celestron telescopes or, uh, you know, just, um, you know, amateur astronomy kits to hire for. Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm sure we, there's some around we could probably find. I've got many of my own. I've got an yeah. 11 inch, uh, um, GPS Celestron. Uh, yeah. I've got a seven and seven inch uh, uh, LX two hundred uh, yeah. Maksutov. Uh, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a, a few myself. Um, but it's for a rental. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. 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 that's uh, yeah. Thank you. So I think Thomas' question was about using hosting groups. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't matter because if you need an individual from the UK signs up to you, that's your group, isn't it? You're yeah. just, being, yeah. you're just a representative, and so yes, yeah, you look at it and put, put, put yourself out to mm -hmm. make, make if you're up and see if it was uh, yeah. worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Um, very interesting. That's brilliant, Bob. A very uh, interesting, useful talk. For that. Thank you. Thank you for a very in-depth look at your uh, surroundings and also some of the um, pics that you put up for us. Thank you. We're all jealous. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, I've got the sky. Um, we have the location. We have the ability, and it's just a matter of putting it together. But, yeah. um, you know, I'd love to host, love to see you guys. and. Uh, you know, just keep looking up and keep looking out because, you know, definitely have to put up some more pictures and, uh, you know, I mean, I've enjoyed this very much. I mean, it works really well. I mean, we've heard every single word. Uh, you know, we've seen all, all you know, your presentation very clearly and, and you've come through loud and clear. So, uh, awesome. You know, it's, it really worked well. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Well, maybe you can have me back someday, huh? Absolutely. Thank you. All right. All right. I'd love to. Love it. Thanks, Bob. I think we'll end it there. Okay. Well, yeah, thank, you. Right. thank you very much. <laughs>